Okay, to start. Okay, we'll begin as we always begin with our profession of faith, and again, Trinity, Incarnation, Paschal Mystery, and the Mystery of the Church. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Now, uh, this uh, section of the Epistle to the Romans, okay, is, um, is really very, not only important in terms of it lays out the whole purpose of the Epistle itself, but for all that we've been talking about here for the last three or four years, okay, this kind of pulls that all together. And so I want to make sure that you really get that as kind of the quote unquote the big picture. And if you have the big picture, then all the particulars, okay, makes sense. And the big picture is we always have to remember there's the creation, there's the fall, and then there's redemption. And they're not three separate acts or three separate items that stand apart from one another. There's no, you couldn't understand the fall unless there was creation. There was no way you can understand Christ if there wasn't the fall, okay? And the fact that Christ comes, okay, it reveals the whole business of creation itself, an act of love by God, okay? So whether you start a creation, you start a redemption, you have to come back. If redemption, to come back to creation. If creation, you have to go to redemption, okay? So you, that's a whole, okay? And to be a Christian, you have to understand that whole. To practice and live your faith, you have to understand that whole. <clears throat> okay? So the first uh, uh, seven uh, chapters, okay, deals with that. Okay? So St. Paul begins his epistle with a sweeping indictment of humanity. He begins right off with the business of that fall. <clears throat> And it's a sweeping indictment of all of humanity because we're talking about the fall and we are talking about original sin. Okay. So when we talk about the fall and we're talking about original sin, we're talking about the four lived love relationships that came from creation because the fall is a rupture of those four relationships. That's what it is. It's a rupture of those four relationships. It's not a disintegration of them. It's a rupture in them. Okay, so the four relationships, again, lived love relationships, is between God and the human being. Okay, then between the love of self, okay, and love of neighbor. And then love of the world, the created world that we live in, because this world was made for us. Okay, it was made for human beings. Okay, so you see on that, on the fall, those four relationships now are severely affected. They're not changed in the sense that they don't exist anymore or they're not part of our created being, but they're ruptured, okay? So Adam and Eve uh, sin, they go and hide from God. The first thing is to retreat from God, the source of that relationships, the source of love. He who is love, they run away from him, okay? The second thing is, where are you? Then he blames her and she blames him. So there's a rupture of human relationships, okay? And we see that concretely with their first child, Cain and Abel. Cain kills Abel. So this is this whole destructiveness that has entered uh, uh, love relationships. Those love relationships now are centered on self to the exclusion of God, the other, and the world. Okay, so that's we got to understand what what that fall means, but we only can understand if we understand what creation is. That God created relationships. So as soon as the baby is conceived in the womb, the baby stands in relationship. You don't create relationships; you are in them. The baby is related immediately to God, who created that uh, little child. Stands in immediate relationship with their mother and father. Okay, and stands in relationship with the world in which they now inhabit. So that's the big picture. Creation, fall, redemption. Creation is the creation of all these four lived love relationships. The fall, okay, is the rupture of those relationships. Redemption is the restoration of those relationships, but to a higher level. It is higher than creation. These love relationships now, we are no longer images, okay, of the likeness of God, okay. We have divine nature that comes into us. Okay? We are part of the divine nature. We are taken up into the divine nature. So that's what's fundamental about redemption is that we come not, and you'll hear it says, well, we come back to the creator. No, we didn't. We came back to a higher state to show the profundity of God's love for us. We sin and he gives us a better deal. We sin and we get a better deal. So that's creation, fall, and redemption. 
So he declares, St. Paul, he declares the world guilty before God. Oh, and I want to think almost the relationship with the world. And then the ground is cursed, okay? So creation itself pays the penalty, okay, for man's sin, okay? So that's why St. Paul says, all of creation is moaning and groaning waiting for this redemption because itself was penalized by that. And because it was made for us, okay, then it's related to us. Insofar we get restored, it will get restored. So the four relationships, right? God, self, neighbor, and the world. So anyway, he, uh, he declares the world guilty before God. The cancer of human rebellion, disobedience, that has brought <coughs> spread rampantly through the Gentiles has also affected Israel. So as a result, peoples, and want to make sure we talk about peoples, this rebellion, this sinfulness is brought only with individuals, but it's in communities also. So communities, a communal life, uh, they also are, are subject to this life of sin. That's why we find it so hard to get along, why families have so much difficulties, okay? Because that's in that communal life. So it's not just the spoiled brat of the, you know, the adulterous husband, okay? Everyone is at one another's throats. Thus the institution of matrimony as a sacrament, because we need a help from outside of ourselves. So as a result, all people stand trapped by and entangled in sin. Thus they are in desperate need of salvation, okay? God responds. Now here we got to get it. God is the actor. We are the acted upon. It's not what I do. It's what God does, okay? I have to be open to the action of God. I am the acted upon. I am the beloved. God is the lover, okay? And this business doing spiritual push-ups so I can get to heaven or I live a good life is absolute nonsense, Okay, that's the reason the sacraments were instituted, that we can receive the grace. The only thing that we contribute to this business of salvation and redemption is being open to the uh, grace of God. Okay, that's our contribution, is uh, extending my freedom to allow God to act upon me. The little flower saying, I stand before God with empty hands. He has everything, I have nothing. He is everything, I am nothing. So just as you put your hands in the doctor when you're sick and do what he tells you, that relationship is same with, uh, with us and with God. But we have the medicine, we have the means, and those are the sacraments. Those are the sacraments. So God is the actor in this tragic state of human affairs. This tragic state of human affairs. And how does he do this? We don't know what love is because all we have is self-interest. We love ourselves. But we had to have love revealed to us so we could know what it is. And how did he reveal love to us? He gave his only begotten son. Christ came on earth for only one purpose. That is to redeem us, pay the penalty in blood for the original sin and all the sins of the world, and thereby open up the way to salvation. So when it comes to redemption, God is the actor and we do nothing. We do absolutely nothing in redemption. What we do is either cooperate for salvation or not cooperate for salvation. But redemption is brought about by God, by God himself. That is, God becomes man. Jesus of Nazareth, the God-man. And that's why the crucifix with a corpus on it, okay, that is our sign. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's how much he loves us. That much, that much, oh, that much. Is how much he loves us. He is the actor. We are the actor upon. That's why the crucified Christ cannot be separated from the Eucharistic Christ. The Eucharist is a sacrament of love. Yeah, but it's a love of blood. It's a love of giving everything of himself for you and for me. Okay, so then the son Jesus Christ who's dying and rising, dying and rising, rescues the fallen human family of Adam and Eve and restores it to a righteous standing with God. So that's when you hear the Protestants I'll say the righteousness of God, the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God is he restores humanity, all every single human person, to a higher state than it was before in creation. We are no longer images and likenesses. We have the divine life within us. In Romans 5, 5, he says, 
the love of God has been poured into our hearts okay, by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what happens in baptism. We are made holy by the power of the Holy Spirit. So each one in, uh, as we look at our bodies, okay, right, we're not only members of the church, the mystical body of Christ, we're also temples of the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit rests within us. That life is in us. That life of love, because the Holy Spirit is the bond of love between the Father and the Son. That's how much God loves us. And he is the lover, we are the beloved. So as a little boy can call up Susie, would you like a date? She can say no, or she can say yes. It's the same with God with us. He brings us into his life via baptism. We can say yes, or we can say no. I'm not interested. Okay. So then, uh, in that state of righteousness, and I just want to make sure we're clear on this righteousness, okay? It is God who makes us right. So the little baby comes out of the mama's, mother's womb. That baby comes into the world in sin and dead. The baby arrives D-O-A. We take him down to the church, Holy Mother Church, okay, ask, what do you want? We want the gift of faith. Are you willing to do blah, blah, blah? Yes, we are. Bring the child in. With the chrism oil, the baptism of water and the spirit, that child is made whole again. Eternal life now is in their being, not eternal death. That a death within them is destroyed and eternal life is given. them. The power of God to love the way God loves, not selfishly, is given to that child. That's the great gift of baptism. Baptism is the new beginning because we've been made righteous by God, okay, and elevated to a higher state than we had at creation. We're no longer images and likeness. We're the real thing. We have God within us. We are taken up into uh, God's life. So when you receive the Holy Eucharist, I think I mentioned it before, you know, you say, well, you are what you eat. Okay, you take in the Eucharist and blah, blah, blah. See, it's just the opposite. We take in the Eucharist so God can come into us and take us into him. So it's he that's taken us into him more and more deeply into his life. That's the importance of receiving the Eucharist regularly, okay, is we're getting more and more deeper into the love and life of God. Why the Eucharist is so important and wants to say a great gift, but it means nothing, okay, without that first pouring out. This is my body, which will be given up for you. This is my blood that will be shed for you. And when you say the girl, Chris, this is the body and blood of Christ, and you say amen, so be it. You are taking that Christ in the outward form of bread and wine into your being. God comes into you in order you take you more into him. Okay, so this selfish love, okay, the new, this new mode of living for human beings, the sinful self, is to love self to the exclusion of God, to neighbor and of the world. So St. Paul reflects deeply on this mystery of sin and salvation in Christ through the Holy Spirit. And this is uh, from Romans 7, okay? And this is a direct quote. And you, you ought to, I'm going to read along slowly so you really get this because this, this is you speaking. This is me speaking. All he's doing is speaking on our, our behalf, okay? And this is our experience. For we know that the law is spiritual. We know that the law of God is good. But I am of the flesh. That is of sinful human flesh. I am rooted into myself. Sold into bondage to sin. In bondage I am a slave to sin, death, and Satan. That's the way I come into this world. For what I do or what I am doing I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do. I don't do what I like to do. I end up doing what I don't want to do. But I'm doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law. I agree with God, confessing that the law is good. God is good. The commandments he gives me is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. So just take a very simple example, right? <clears throat> you're going to bed and you set the alarm clock, 
okay, to get up in the morning. Now, you set it. No one made you set it. You personally set it. It goes off, and immediately you're mad, angry, swearing, I don't want to get up. What rational human being would set an alarm clock and get mad because it went off? But that's that kind of schizophrenia that we have. This is, the psych this is true Christian psychology. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing, but the doing, okay, of the good is not. I want to be good. I will to be good. I wish to be good. My performance stinks. He didn't say that, but it's like that. For the good that I want, I do not do. But I practice the very evil that I do not want. But I am not, if I, but if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. So that's so important for people to understand this whole motion to everything that's not good, I don't want to do it. That's not me. That's the law of sin within me. Okay. When I do good and move towards good, that's not me doing it either. It's the grace of God that's empowering me to do that. So as I sit here, he says, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of like a, a ping pong ball. Bing, bong, bing, bong, going back and forth. But sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, that is, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, in my inmost self, okay, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind. So I am at war. They're fighting over me, the law of sin and the law of grace. Making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who, not what, who will set me free from this body of death. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So God is the actor. He is the one who's going to set me free. He's the one that empowers me. If I do good, it's grace doing it. If I do rotten things, it's me doing it. So then he says, on the one hand, I myself, in my mind, am serving the law of God. But on the other, with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. So that's true Christian psychology. That's your real psychology. Okay, so when he says who will take me out of this, there is a principle, okay, at work here. And it's a very common sense principle, okay. A person cannot give to themselves what they do not have. You may have your arms, you want to flay them, and you want to fly, but you cannot fly because you aren't made for flying. If you want to fly, then you'd have to get a, a whole new being. Okay? You cannot give to yourself what you do not have. If you are held in, 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 in the clutches okay, of sin, Satan, and death, okay, you cannot take yourself out of that. So all the spiritual push-ups that you want to do, the jogging, whatever it is, okay, it ain't going to work. You're kidding yourself. That's the big lie. Again, all it is is rooted in self. Poor man that I am, wretched man that I am, who will take me out of this? That's the whole, they can give me something that I don't have, is God himself. So you have to receive your perfection or that which you want, that which you need, from a source outside of and superior to yourself. Let me say that once again. You can, a person cannot give to themselves what they do not have. They cannot give to themselves what they do not have. They must receive that from a source outside of and greater or superior to the self. That's a fundamental principle. And that's where this whole business then we understand God is the actor and I am the actor the point because I cannot do it. I cannot give this up. Okay. I mean, that's embarrassing. You need a, a, an alarm clock to get out of bed. I can't even get out of bed and what now I'm going to be holy? Okay. So then the second thing we want to talk about is this business of justification since, okay, there's a lot of misunderstandings of what justification itself is, okay. So the verb justify, okay, means to acquit, 
to vindicate or to pronounce righteous. Okay, so in other words, a penalty for original sin of death in sin had to be paid for in order to have life and grace. And Christ is the one who paid for that in blood. He pays the ransom to God the Father. Thus freeing, opening up the way to salvation. But without that redemption, without that ransom being paid, the doors of heaven are closed and we're still in a state of slavery and death. <clears throat> the word is used 15 times in the epistle to the church in Rome. He uses justification or justified 15 times in the church of Rome and 24 times in the rest of the New Testament. Okay. So justification, okay, is absolutely essential to understand. But you, I want to make emphasize with as much strength as I can, it's a right a restoration to righteousness that's superior to creation. Okay, we're not just back to where we were. We're given a higher state of living. Okay, the reason that Saint Augustine and Saint Thomas Aquinas argue why Lucifer fell, why he rebelled against God. Okay, it was not that God was going to uh, uh, go down and save man from his sylphiness, but he was going to go down and raise him higher than the angels. So Mary is queen of the angels. That's what the rebellion was, that you would take this lowly, filthy, rotten, sinful self and restore them to a higher state than the angels. Not only were we higher than the cre creation, but we're higher than the angels. And that was the rebellion of Satan and the, uh, the other uh, fallen angels. So in a legal context, a judge justifies an innocent person when he acquits him or her of unproven charges. Okay. The problem is that we had proven charges against us. We were guilty. Instead, he still acquitted us. If you saw that in a courthouse, there'd be blue bloody murder all over the place. Right? Which is contrary to justice. But see, justice is in the name of the game. Love is the name of the game. He so loved us. He gave his only begotten son. So again, God is the actor. God is the actor, we are the acted upon. God is the lover, we are the beloved. He is the one who justifies by his actions, by his act. Okay. So the justification came first of all with redemption, that is he paid the penalty. Okay. And then comes the salvation where now we're free to accept him or not accept him. But we could not have that freedom unless he first paid the penalty, unless he paid the ransom. Justification describes how God reestablishes humanity in a right covenant relationship with himself. Okay. So this covenant relationship okay, uh, is this relationship of being united with him in his body and in his blood. This is, the, this is the covenant of my blood, the new and eternal covenant. We are, we are brought into his very life, into his very being. No longer images, but the real thing. This new covenant relationship was made possible by the death of Jesus of Nazareth. No crucified Christ, no Eucharistic Christ. No crucified Christ, no redemption. No crucified Christ, no salvation. And that was on a moment cost on Mount Calvary. That death was a ransom payment that freed humanity from eternal death in sin. And that's why in the old modes of uh, baptism, it was really symbolic that they would take the person and bring them into the water, okay? Because you're, you're going now into the death of Christ in order to be rise again. So three times you're baptized into the death of Christ, then you get life. So death had to be destroyed in order to have life. So dying, you destroyed our death, Rising, you restored our life. So the Paschal mystery is death, resurrection. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O oh Lord. We profess your death, O oh Lord, in your resurrection. That death is there because that's the payment, that's the symbol, that's our life. Then comes everything else, comes the bennies. Okay, so that freedom came through the supernatural gift of grace. Okay, that's a gift. It's given to us freely. We didn't earn it. It's like the little baby coming out of the womb. The mother loves it. The kid didn't do anything to deserve that love. He's loved gratuitously. You love it for no other, no other reason that it, that's my baby, that's my child, that's a human being. Okay. 
totally and completely gratuitous. And that's why I keep mentioning, okay, as a individual female, W, okay, you may be a lazy, no good slob and have sin up to your eyeballs, okay? But by nature, you are given that selfless love in your heart as a mother. And that's the great gift of woman, okay, to the world, especially to men. And that's where you see this business of not having children, you don't see that love. When you see the woman having the children, you see that love. That's the witness. That's the real thing. That's the real uh, act of God. Without merit, without desert. The child has done nothing to earn that unconditional love. And that's a great gift of woman in the mode of motherhood. So for Christianity, this gift of grace comes in baptism. That's where we get it. So just as a child receives the great gift of maternal love at the moment of conception, every woman knows, knows when she's pregnant, okay? So when you bring the church to Mother Church, okay, at baptism, it's the same thing analogously. Furthermore, when God acquits the sinner, he also adopts the sinner. So it's okay, you're free, you know, bug off. No, I forgive you, but now you're going to be a child of God. You're my child. And that same relationship now of mother-child, father-child, okay, comes into our being. Sin is not only taken away, we're not even put into the place of the thing, but now we are heirs. We are children of God. And we have rights as children. So justification uh, by God then affects the whole person. It affects the whole person because we are a whole person, body, soul, spirit. And it affects an inward transformation that makes the baptized person holy. And again, we talked about holy meaning set apart, set apart. So when the baby is baptized, it's set apart from sin and death and put into the state of grace and holiness. In righteousness, that is right relationships. We now have a right relationship with God. We have a right relationship with myself. I have a right relationship with you, my neighbor, and I have a right relationship with the world. Everything now is Jake. In the sight of God. And I have some citations there if you want to kind of look it up in the catechism. Okay, justification, okay, can only be understood in the context of creation, fall, and redemption. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. This Christ of ours makes absolutely no sense without the fall. The fall makes no sense unless we were created free for love. Because that's how the fall happens. It was a choice, made a free choice. But that's our great gift. Our great gift, and we're still free. We can say yes to God, and we can say no to God. We can make ourselves available to the sacraments in prayer, or we cannot. So our freedom is still intact. Okay, okay. name the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen.